we definitely don't want to lose that, do we? Because that's something that we get that God has given to us since many of the years. I just wanted to remind you that, and that's how we ended up beginning to sing How Great Thou Art, and we've been singing it ever since. Amen? So let us stand. As I mentioned, it's on page 45 in the Red Book. If you don't know it, many of you have them on your iPads now. Oh, there's two. Well, my, mine says 45, unless my glasses aren't working. Well, that's the original. Well, the 44. I see there's two different versions. Okay. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder. <laughs> what a wonderful piece. Consider all the worlds thy hand has made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Power throughout the universe display. Then saves my soul, my Savior God to me.
God, great is thy faithfulness. It's right here in front of me, just page 43. Oh God, my Father. Yes. Are you thankful that you can call God your Father today? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Out of the 7.3 billion people in the world, you can call God your Father. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Amen. There's no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not. We live in a world where things are just changing at lightning speed. But he does not change. His faithfulness never changes. His grace will never be diminished. If anything, his grace is getting larger all the time, more encompassing. Amen? Oh, Lord. Thy compassion say fail not when you're down to the very bottom of the pit. Jesus has compassion for you. He has empathy for you. He feels your every sorrow, your burden, your loneliness. Oh, sometimes you can be so lonely, you don't know what to do with yourself. You only just reach out to him. He will gladly extend his love to you. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm sorry, as thou hast been, thou forever will be. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> oh, I get excited. I don't know what's wrong. I just see. I'm excited tonight. Amen. I'm excited because I know that God is here in this place, this very place. He's not a long ways away. He's here right now. His Holy Spirit is moving. He's touching each one of our hearts. Oh, we're so privileged. Amen. Amen. Let's sing it with all of our hearts. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my God.
The whole world is seeking for peace. They're trying everything they can to bring peace in the world, but they can't do it. And they never will be able to do it without Jesus. And we have the secret. You have the secret to peace. Someday your neighbor's going to ask you, see, how can you have that peace in your heart that I don't have? And Jesus said, you're just going to give them an answer for the hope that lies within you. Amen. And you will minister life to somebody, and they will have that peace. Amen? Amen. Maybe you've done that many times, but you may be doing it a lot more in the days that lie ahead. Straight for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient is the evil thereof, Jesus said. There's no need. Why waste your time even thinking about tomorrow? You, we need the strength of the Holy One today to carry out what God has asked us to do today. Amen? Amen. Straight for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Many people commit suicide because they have no hope. But we have hope. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, the angel said that Jesus is going to return in like manner that he ascended. Amen. He's coming back to this earth to be joined with his elect company. Oh, glory to God. And usher his kingdom here on this earth. We, God, has opened up our hearts, our understandings to believe this truth with all of our hearts. Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Blessings are mine with ten thousands besides. Maybe he should have said ten million. I don't know. Oh, hallelujah. I'm excited. Are you excited? Amen. Well, sing like you're excited. Amen. Pardon for sin and the He yielded his life. 
And it's a sign that you are willing to surrender your life to Jesus in a much greater way than you've already said. You've given him until this very hour. And there's something that happens when you physically do something to express your appreciation for Jesus. When you raise your hands, it means I don't care what other people think of me. I don't care if people think I'm too bold or I'm too, out of, you know, offside or something. It means that you want to yield your life to Jesus. And in return, he just pours his blessing down on you. You'll experience something you've never experienced before. You can never raise your hands to Jesus. I encourage you tonight. We sing that one more time. Just raise your hands. Just hold them up as long as you can. I know physically we can't hold them up for too long, but let's just raise our hands to Jesus and surrender to him. And tell him how much we appreciate him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sing it again. Thank you, Lord. We have to see it's I think it's number one for those that don't know and it's some of the most beautiful verses. Some of these pieces that were written many years ago by people that were touched by the Holy Spirit. And they were obedient and took their pen. And they held a pen and Jesus gave them the words. 
Amen. And their blessing has to be. Amen. 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 At the cross, at the cross. <laughs> Do you remember when you first gave your heart to Jesus? Maybe it was in a Sunday school. Maybe your mom and dad led you. Maybe it was later in life. I'm sure you can remember that very moment. It's right there in your mind and you can't get rid of it because it's that special. It's that life changing. It's utterly life changing. Amen. Because we knelt at the cross of Calvary. Amen. We kneeled at the cross and we submitted our life to Jesus. I quoted a scripture the other night. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son. I have a son. I have four grandsons. The thought of having to send them to die on a cross for your sins, I don't know how God could possibly do that. But that's how much he loved us. Even though we were sinners, not walking with God, he sent his son to die for us. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. When you, Brother Cephas, that was quoting that, when he said that he rolled away, he used his hands like this. He just, couldn't you just see? I just, when he said that, he had his hands going like this, and I saw the burdens of many souls just rolling down that hill across the Calvary. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And we're going to sing this song, and we'll more to end up start clapping. And the Lord seemed to make something real to me when we were camped too about these ten instruments. One night I woke up in the night and I was thinking about clapping. And the Lord just seemed to say to me in, in the night time, what if you didn't have 10 fingers? And I started to count in the night time all the different things I can do because he's given me 10 fingers. Yeah, right. And the list, it, I went, finally went to sleep reciting different things. <laughs> <laughs> we use our, our fingers for so many things. Yeah. One of the things we can do is when we're all clapping, we can all clap together. Amen. When the spirit of clapping is on us, we all clap together. And they are instruments of righteousness. And we clap. And we don't clap as I mentioned the other day like this. We give it our all. Amen? Amen. If you haven't been to the West Indies, just I encourage you to go there. You'll come back clapping. Right, Brother C? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. At the cross, at the cross. Let's sing it. At the cross, at the cross, where I
like the angels of the Lord. I'm sure that even at this very moment, the windows of heaven are open and they're all leaning down listening to you. Because you haven't experienced the angels have not had. And that is the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, Brother Patterson was here. He'd want to sing the next page. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, it's on, yeah, it is. Page two, Glorious Salvation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful way. Amen. Amen. Is that all I got was one amen? And <laughs> amen. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Cephas. <laughs> it's a wonderful way. Amen. 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 Let us see, you're going to have to teach them how to say amen real like they do, don't they? <clears throat> it's a wonderful way. Amen. 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 God has shed his light upon my pathway. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> my way keeps growing brighter. And I want to shout the same. A creature of eternity. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just to think, a child of the king. Amen. How many people in the world would like to be a child of the king in the natural? Yes. We're a child of the king that created all the heavens. Amen. Made everything that's beautiful that we see witness with our eyes. And he created you. He'd actually created you in the very palm of his hands. <laughs> he decided what you should look like, yeah. what your personality would be like, what your dislikes would be, the color of your eyes, how tall you would be, the color of your hair. He decided before you were born. Yeah. He created you personally. Yeah. Now just imagine. If you were able to create a human being, what kind of relationship would you have to that human being? It would be the most special thing you could ever possibly imagine. Yes. And that's why Jesus loves us so much. Because his father created us in his own hand. Yes. Oh, glory. So much to be thankful for, don't we? Yeah. Let's sing it. Thank you. It's a glorious salvation, it's a wonderful day.
you have it in the King James Version, you'll find it in the King James Version. I wonder if you keep them going out here. We'll soon find out. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's in the Red Book as well. I can tell you the first time we sang that song in this mood. Are you in for stories tonight? If you're tired, you can sit. But if you want to, don't be, if you feel tired, there's nothing wrong with sitting. You can praise the Lord sitting too. Amen. And we understand that sometimes your legs, you know, can't take it anymore, simply. You sit and then stand up again if you want to stand up. 150th song, Crazy the Lord. <clears throat> the first time that was sung, <laughs> vivid memories. Uh, there was a camp, we used to have a western camp meeting in a place called Salem, Oregon. Yeah. How many of you have been in Salem, Oregon? Yeah. Quite a few here, actually. Arthur has. Remember them? You were just a little guy then. <laughs> we had some glorious times there. Maybe you were water baptized there. I don't know. It was tremendous meetings. And uh, somebody had come and they taught us that song and we started to sing it. Brother Witter was there, and we were preparing. He prepared a tape, uh, music for his, his broadcast. And uh, he, <clears throat> we would practice, and then, then he would record it. And we started singing that song, and it, it wasn't long before everybody was singing. We sang it through that camp meeting over and over and over again. Did anybody find the page? 49. I'm deaf. I need only one person to say it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 49 in the back. 49 in the back. 49 in the back. Thank you. Now, I'm going to give you some instructions. You look down there, you find it in your Bible or in your red book. I want you to put. When it comes to the point where it says, Praise with the sound of the trumpet, that's where the men sing. Okay? You girls are saying. And then you girls sing, praise him with the song. <laughs> okay? And then the, the men sing, praise him with the timbrel and dance. And then you girls sing, praise him with string ornaments. String ornaments and ornaments. Okay? And then we all sing together, praise him upon the loud cymbals. Now, it, do I have to repeat that or did you get it? I think you're good. I'm sorry for making fun, but. <laughs> Andy's actually laughing, so maybe I'm <laughs> I can't undo you and your jokes, of Andy, but we do appreciate them. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the Sing it one more time. The girls sound so beautiful on those high notes. I could never do that. 
express how much we love you tonight. We've tried our very best in singing these songs of praise and worship. But I know that you understand our hearts. And you affirm that you understand us and that you believe the things that we are saying when we say we love you and we praise you. And in return your Holy Spirit is just sending on us and we could feel your very presence tonight. Amen. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Amen. Thank you for your saving grace. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that we had an opportunity to be baptized in water and to bury our old self and rise again Amen. as new creations in you. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We thank you for the vision and hope that you have given us and made very clear to us. Even though there are many that are not privileged to know this, we recognize that we are very privileged and we praise you. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Thank you, Jesus, that you live today within our hearts. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Brethren.
Amazing Grace. <laughs> what a story. Marcus started that first song this evening, and he was talking about nature and and all the things that God has created. And I just wanted you to think about something tonight. Why, why did God create everything he's created? Why did he create the universe, the angels, the plants, the animals, man? Why did he send the prophets, the patriarchs? Why did he build the nation of Israel, give the law, send a savior? Establish the church, promise the kingdom. Why? What is the central purpose of all of these things that God has done and is doing? God always has a purpose for what he does. There are no random things that happen in the world. They may appear random to people. But they are not random. They are according to a plan and purpose that God has had before the foundations of the world were laid. And with every, with the purpose that God has, there is a plan to, to accomplish that purpose. And it is important for us to know what the plan and purpose of God is because that gives us perspective on where we fit into this plan of God. God wants us to know something as much as necessary about his plan so that we see how we fit into that plan. What is that central purpose of the totality of the plan of God? Does anybody want to just take a guess? What is the central purpose of God's plan? I'll tell you what the central purpose is. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. What is the central purpose and totality? What is the focus of the plan of God? It's the purpose of God. Who is it? It is Jesus Christ. <laughs> He is the reason that God is doing everything that he is doing. It's for the purpose of glorifying that, the, that, that his son might be glorified in all the things that he has created. It is for his glorification that these things, all these things are done. If you think about that, if you... If you have children and you, you have some inheritance to leave them, usually your inheritance go to your children. Everything you have when you die usually goes to your children. They, are, they inherit everything you have. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, and he is the one who will inherit everything that has been created. Amen. Everything is for him. It is, it, it is for that purpose. He is the central focus of the purpose and plan of God. <clears throat> what, is pre, what does preeminence mean? What is that? What's that word mean? Anybody? First. First. 
ultimate authority? State of superiority. State of superiority. Absolutely. Supremacy. Dominion. Sovereignty. Predominance. Ascendancy. That he says this is for, for that he may have all of these things. He may have the preeminence. It is through the Son at the cost of his own blood that we are redeemed, freely forgiven, through that full and generous grace which has overflowed unto our lives and opened our eyes to the truth. For God had allowed us to know the secret of his plan, and it is this. You got that? That's the, here he's going to tell us what the secrets of his plan is. Now I'm reading from Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, the J.B. Phillips translation. And it is this. He purposes in his sovereign will that all human history shall be consummated in Christ. That everything that exists in heaven or earth shall find its perfection in and its fulfillment in him. Amen. You know, God is going to perfect everything that he has created. Everything. Every single thing. You talk about walking through the woods and, and seeing and feeling the glory of God. And as wonderful as that is, everywhere you go, there is the evidence of death. Even though there is life, for everything that is alive, something else had to die in order for life to grow. But there is coming a day when God is going to restore this creation where death has no part of it anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Christ did not enter history born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem just to destroy the power of Satan and redeem mankind. Christ has been and will always be the center of God's plan. He has always been with God from the very beginning. He will always be with God in the very end. So he entered history, was incarnated at that point, but he has been there forever. He created all of these things. It is says, by him and for him, all things are created. We're created. <clears throat> Romans eleven thirty six. For him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ was the explicit image of God the Father. In the flesh he came to demonstrate uh, to us what the Father is like. So when we see Jesus... We see the Father. When we see the Holy Spirit, we see the Father. Because they are three as one. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus Christ is not complete without the body. Amen. It is the, the, the fullness of God will be completed when the body is united to the head. Yeah. <laughs> Even from the beginning, 
all creation, including man, and especially man, was to manifest the glory of God and become an inheritance for his son, the Christ of God. There are many spiritual truths that we are aware of. Many of them have been covered here this week. Many of them, and every one of them is important. But they are like spokes on a wheel. They, the spokes come out of a hub and they hit the rim at different points and all of them are important to the structure of the wheel. But they all come back to one center point, yeah. which is that hub, and that hub is Christ, the Son of God. Yeah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to go back. This has been ministered some before, but Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Because this is where the plan of God began to unfold, at least from what is recorded for us. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Man was God's crowning creation and was to reflect the glory of Christ. Now, he put Adam and Eve in the garden with one test, one, one commandment, to them one just one test he said there's everything in this garden all the trees you could partake freely of all the fruit of, in this garden but there's one tree you can't partake of and that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and of course we know without going into a lot of the detail that Adam and Eve failed that one test the problem was is that there was another tree there that was the tree of life and I'm confident that that tree of life was the Son of God. And his purpose or his plan was, is for them to partake of that tree of life. And then they would take within them the very essence of the life of Christ, and they would begin right there to manifest the glory of God because they would have taken Christ into them. But that 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 they failed in that plan. Now it's it's easy to you know we, we use these words about failure, but but somehow God knew all of, He knew all of this would happen. He He knows everything, so He knew that that would happen. So that was a it was the beginning of a type and shadow for us though, so that we could see really what God plans to do. <clears throat> Psalm 19 and 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. However, nothing in all of God's creation yet fully manifests the glory of God. Right. We see many beautiful things that God has created, and, and they're wonderful, and we appreciate them. But we have yet to see the real full glory of God manifested in everything he has created, whether it is in mankind or, or what we call nature. Amen. Romans 8, 20 and 21, and I'm reading from J.B. Phillips. The world of creation cannot as yet see reality, not because it chooses to be blind, but because in God's purpose it has been so limited, yet it has been given hope. And the hope is that in the end, the whole of created life will be rescued from the tyranny of change and decay and have its share in that magnificent liberty which can only belong to the children of God. 
Now we begin to get a little bit better picture of how God plans to restore his creations back to that perfect state. And he says to us that that magnificent liberty, that freedom, that restoration, which has been talked about this week, it can only belong, it can only come through, it can only be manifest through the children of God. Amen. Who we are. Amen. Praise God. So, we begin to see, we begin to see even more about what God is expecting from his people. <clears throat> now, if we go back, it's interesting to look back through biblical history at the, at the seven dispensations. Now, these dispensations are not really mentioned in the Bible, but, but man in studying these things has, has sort of seen this, this pattern and has kind of overlaid this template of, of dispensations on them. I want you to notice as we go through these what we, what we see happening in this, this repeatability, if you will, that we see in these dispensations. Now, as we go through this, I, I, I want to reemphasize, I want to emphasize this, that when, that, that what I'm trying my best to communicate to you by the, by, the, by the Spirit is not my plan. It's God's plan. Yeah, yeah. And, and so... <clears throat> My, our purpose is to understand that plan and then to fit in with it. I appreciated so much what Brother Andy ministered last night. These practical things that, that are part of God's pattern. Amen. And he said, you know, we don't have to understand them all, but we need to be obedient to them. Do those things. Do the little things that God has asked us to do. Amen. I think it was... Uh, I quoted a, a man by the name of Andrew Bonar, who was an old Scottish preacher at, at Feast uh, this past year. And it, it, when I read this, it really stuck with me. And it says, it, it is not the importance of the command, but the majesty of the one giving the command Amen. that determines the standard of obedience. Hmm. So when we, we, it is not up to us to evaluate the reasonability of the command, what we look at is who is giving the command. Yeah. And it's the majesty, the majesty of God, the one giving the command that determines our standard of obedience. Nothing yeah. more, nothing less. <clears throat> First dispensation, innocence. What was the test? Well, we've already talked about that. Avoid the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve were redeemed from that sin through the shed blood of innocent animals as they were killed to provide clothing for them. And when they, when they were... Uh, told to vacate, commanded to vacate the Garden of Eden, then God posted a guard at the Tree of Life. So they could not get back into the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life, we're going to get to it, but it's going to go a long way around to get back to it. And he got that guard there so that they, they couldn't go back and get in there. <coughs> the next dispensation is, is titled or termed the dispensation of conscience. Well, the test was is when the instruction was when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, they were to do good and they were to offer blood sacrifices. They knew that because Abel had, had understood that. He had to get it from his parents, I'm sure, so they knew that they were to give blood sacrifices of, of innocent animals. Well, what was the result of that 
what happened at the end of that dispensation. Remember? <coughs> Massive wickedness. And God repented that he had made man. And he judged, he judged the earth with a flood. But there were eight people who were saved. There was a remnant that God took out of all of those people. And he saved them. Now, actually, there was another one recorded in Scripture, Enoch. He didn't go, he, he, just, he just went the shortcut. He just <laughs> went straight to the Lord. But in this plan, God took eight people. He took Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, and he took them out of that dispensation into the next dispensation, which is human government. Now, the test here, the thing that God instructed them to do was to scatter throughout the earth, multiply, and fill it. Right after the flood, that was the instruction that he gave to Noah and his family. Well, what was the result of that? You remember? Well, they didn't scatter. <laughs> they didn't fill the earth. They stayed together. And their pride and their arrogance began to grow. And so what did they do? They said, we're going to build a tower, a monument to our pride and our arrogance. And so God had to intervene. He, they were all speaking the same language. They had such unity, but they were unified going in the wrong direction. And God frustrated their languages. He terminated that project. And just by virtue of their inability to communicate, they scattered. So he, he got them scattered. <clears throat> but out of those people, he took another remnant. Yeah. What was that? Who was that remnant? Abraham, Abraham and his wife. <laughs> out of that whole dispensation, he said, these people here... This remnant, I'm going to take out to the next step. And so, <clears throat> that became the dispensation of promise. Now, I don't fully understand this because in reading this passage of Scripture, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase through this, but there, but, but God had promised Abraham that he would lead them into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and he would give that to him and all of his descendants. And they they got there. They got into Canaan, but they didn't stay. They went on through Canaan because of the Canaanites that were there. They went on through and went into Egypt. And we know what happened to them in Egypt. They went into bondage in Egypt. And, and so what did God do from all of those... The, the nation of Israel that had grown to millions of people. And so who did he call? He got a remnant there. Who did he call? Moses. He called Moses. <laughs> and he dealt with Moses and Mo Moses and Aaron. And he spoke to them and he said, okay, I want you to lead these people out of captivity. And so in the next dispensation was the dispensation of the law. And the test was... Keep the law and offer blood sacrifices for failure. You know, it's interesting that, you know, God gave them the law, but he knew that they could not, they, they could not obey the law fully. So he gave them the, 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 the process of offering sacrifices. And that's all he really, he asked them to obey the law, knew they couldn't do that, but he provided the way for them through the blood sacrifices because he was all the time pointing to who? He was pointing to Jesus Christ and the cross. Well, they, did, they not only did not keep the law, they didn't perform the blood sacrifices as God commanded. And Andy went through those last night. I thought that was such a blessing. He went through those seven things that the Lord said. You know, at the end of that dispensation, he just went quiet for 400 years. 
And that closed out that dispensation. And then there's the next dispensation, which is the dispensation of what? Grace. 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 Okay. The requirement of this, the test of this dispensation, receive the forgiveness of sins through the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for redemption and reconciliation to God and in the process of becoming spiritually mature through the sanctifying work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That was the test of that dispensation. Well, that's the dispensation that we're in right now. And God told us through the revelation that he gave to John, he told us what to expect and what we would see at the end, at during and at the end of this dispensation, which we are in right now. <clears throat> I kind of went through that revelation chapters two and three where, where Jesus spoke to, to reveal to John these things these, these things of his assessment of the seven churches. And I don't know whether I, I can get this exactly right or not, but, but not only does it speak of things going on in those actual churches, but it also speaks to us of things that have, are happening to the church or in the church through this dispensation of time. So it's not only addressing... The, the actual things that went on there, but it is it is telling us what phases the church would go through in this dispensation. And <clears throat> these are just some of the things that I just sort of pulled out of there, the, 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 the problems that he observed with the various churches. One, one is they had left their first love. Two, they were allowing the values of the world to influence the life of the church. Do we see that today? Do we see it in general Christendom? Do we see it in ourselves? If we're honest, we have to say that. 2 Timothy 3 and 1 through 5. Know this. That in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Now, he, he, this would certainly apply to the world, but when he says this, he said, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know, the world isn't trying, they're, they're making no pretenses about being godly. The godly that he's talking about has to be within the church, that there is this appearance or this attempt to, to show godliness, but there's really no power there. He says, from such people turn away. Another one of the problems that he observed was servants of God following false teachings and departing from the truth. <clears throat> I appreciate what has been ministered earlier in this week about, about staying with the order and foundation that God has established. Yeah. Let me tell you this, saints of God. If the foundation that is being laid by the current apostolic brethren is wrong in any way, we will answer to God for that, not you. Amen. <laughs> Your responsibility is to take that which is which is revealed to the apostolic brethren given to you to walk in those things. If that is not right, God will deal with us. You got you got nothing to worry about. Yeah. 
2 Timothy 4 and 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. I think it was uh, Brother Cephas this morning that talked about that. Don't, don't leave that. With the, don't leave the pattern that God has put us in. This is, as Brother Marcus said, this is a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to walk in these things that God has revealed. In these last days, in perhaps even these final hours. Amen. Don't depart from the things. Hang in there. Amen. Even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when you don't understand, even when you question, just hang in there. Another thing, having an appearance of life, but actually being spiritually dead. Becoming apathetic about spiritual things. Just being ho-hum. The Bible uses the term lukewarm. We, we get the picture. Revelation 3, 15 through 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In every one of these churches, he had these things that he, he was pleased with. He had some things, a number of pretty serious things that he was displeased with. Actually, sexual immorality was one of those things that I didn't mention, but it was mentioned a couple of times in there. <clears throat> But he also spoke something to those that he referred to as overcomers. As overcomers. Amen. And, and there were some things that he said, and I just jotted them down this afternoon, <coughs> because there's, there, there's kind of a central theme that runs through these things that he said to those who would be overcomers. What is an overcomer? Huh? He that endureth unto the end. That's good. That's right. It's a, it's somebody that comes over. <laughs> you come over. Overcomer. This is what he said. Hold fast what you have till I come. Amen. Hold fast what you have till I come. Remember how you have received and heard. Hold fast and keep my commands to persevere. Hallelujah. Boy, you see the theme there. Don't depart. Hang in there. Keep going. Don't lose hope. Persevere. Yes. Persevere Hallelujah. until the end. I like the way that, that Watchman Nee put it. And it's basically the same as what is stated uh, in Brother Wager's booklet, The Church. And I'm just going to read some of this. I, it, it's more or less a quote, I guess. But, but I think it says the truth. And, and this, is a hard, this is a hard saying, but, but it's, it's, a, it's the truth and it's important. And, and we, there's nothing we can do to water it down. Whenever the whole body fails to carry out the full plan of God, he will choose a relatively few to stand for the whole body. God calls these few to carry out his commands so that through them he may later reach the many. Did we not see that and do we not see that in other examples in the scripture where the whole body fails? He will take those who will simply, they are not some special class or sect or tribe of people. It's just simply those people who will conform to the original plan of God. 
They will conform to those things that if you look back through the ages. You go all the way back to Adam. What was what or, or what was Abel? And what Abel was required to do was one thing. Do the blood sacrifice. He was faithful in that. And I he's right up there in that company of overcomers. Yeah. And as we go down through the ages, God reveals more. And the more he reveals, the more we are responsible to walk in. But the overcomers in each in each dispensation are those who conform to the, the purpose and plan of God as 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 God had laid it out. Yeah. And that chain or that line of overcomers has never been broken. They've always been there from one dispensation. They're not all listed in the scriptures. Some are. But there are many we don't know. But they're all there. <laughs> they're all named and God knows exactly who they are. And God has set those people aside. Now he is not, we have to remember God's purpose is to recover the entire created mm -hmm universe to himself Amen. so this is not this is not because he doesn't like these other people he doesn't but but this is his way of operating he will take a few to reach the many yes Amen. i know i have told this story of this analogy many times but it is so good that i just have to you know some of you may have not heard it but but well I, i'll change it I'll change it to a little different one, but you may not have heard. But if you, you know, Jesus, Jesus said one time, uh, and, and and I'll paraphrase par, par, paraphrase the, 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 uh, the what he said. But he was these people were talking about him and he to him, and they said, you know, Lord, haven't we we've done all these things? We we've done these miracles. We have cast out demons. We. We've, we've done all these wonderful things. And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Boy, that's a strong statement. But what really is iniquity or wickedness? It's just a failure to conform to the plan of God. To do what God has said. No more, no less. And when he says, I don't know you, I'm sure he's saying to those people, it's not that I was not acquainted with you or I, did, I, I, I don't know who you are but what he's saying is I don't know you for this particular purpose hmm. this particular purpose of, of of becoming those forerunners you're, 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 you're not ready for that it's like if you've got some important documents to sign and you pick up a fountain pen and you start to sign and it write it. And you say, you lay that pen down and you pick up another one. It's got ink in it. And you can write it. Now this one, this one will eventually have ink in it. It can go and be filled with ink. But for right now, it's not, it's not good to you. So I don't know that pen right now for this purpose, so I'm laying it aside. That doesn't mean that that pen is no good and will never be able to write. It just says it's not ready, it's not ready to go right now. What God is looking for is out of the church because where the church as an entire body of Christians has failed, as he has said that it would, he's told us it would happen, he is looking for those who are willing to conform as close as possible as they know how to the perfect plan of God. Those are the ones that he is looking for. <clears throat> we see this pattern of the church in the wilderness. A mixed multitude came out of Egypt. There were others besides Israelites that came out. But Israel itself was called to a greater measure of consecration. And out of the nation of Israel, the priesthood was called a still a, a further uh, commitment or consecration. <clears throat> Out of that, Joshua or Joshua and Caleb and the younger generation were called out of those who died in the wilderness to enter the promised land. There were many callings out, 
but there were always others who were called to go on where others refused to go. Amen. Yes. Amen. And that God called Israel to be a kingdom or a nation of priests among the nations of the world. That was his plan, was that the nation of Israel would be an example to all the other nations of the world. This was this showed his his love has always been for for all of his creation. He didn't just love Israel and hate everybody else. He loved Israel and wanted them to follow his commandments, to, to glorify his name, and that they would be an example. But they, they failed in that. <clears throat> he called them to be a kingdom of priests, but it was no time in the, until the people were worshiping the golden calf. So God selected the Levites who kept his commands to be overcomers. Now, that was a tough job. He said, who will stand with me? And they came out. The Levites came out. And he said, take your sword down and start killing people. And 70,000 they killed. Now, that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard thing. But God was looking for those out of that, that whole group. He took these to be the priesthood. God dealt with David first and then he worked through him to deliver Israel from the Philistines and from there to become a great nation Jesus gained 12 ultimately 11 and from there came 120 and from 120 came the church always a calling out a small number to reach the many Amen. <laughs> Revelation 17 and 14 These will make war with the Lamb And the Lamb will overcome them For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings And those who are with him Are the called, the chosen, and the faithful <clears throat> When the church fails in the responsibility God finds overcomers who will do who will do what the church as a whole has failed to do. The overcomers in the church age are a church within a church. <coughs> First Peter 2 and 5, the church is referred to as a house made of living stones. But this, you know, I, I hadn't checked this out with the brethren, the other brethren, so... I don't know, but this just popped out to me this week when I was, was reading this. But this is, he, you know, Peter says the church is made of living stones. But when he was speaking of the church at Philadelphia, in which he had nothing bad to say about that church, <clears throat> this is what he said. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which come down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He said they would be pillars in the temple. So within that, within that church, perhaps, of all believers, there are those who will be pillars. There will be those who are structurally holding up the house of God, the new Jerusalem, whatever you want to call it, that, that will be there holding up. They are standing in that place of sacrifice, that place of death, if you will, so that others may live. Now those who, who sign up for that, you wonder why they would really sign up for that. But, but God has made a promise <laughs> And if we have, if if the love of Christ, when or I shall say, when the love of Christ is is manifested, certainly in a greater way, and I think I think He's doing that in us now. He is He He will create in us enough love for those who are who are who who just don't have the the willingness to make those sacrifices. He is calling some who will sacrifice. For them. And those are the ones who are the overcomers. 
<clears throat> However, God's purpose is never to abandon the others, but to grow up forerunners who will go before and make the way for others to follow. There's a passage of scripture in Luke 14, 25 through 30, 33. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You know, there, there are many, many of us, many Christians in the world who are willing to send some money, are willing to send some soldiers. But, but Christ is saying, to be an, if you're going to be an overcomer, you have to send all. It has to be complete. One of the the best pictures that I can think of, and Brian Hannigan ministered on this at the North Battleford camp, and it comes from the third chapter of Joshua. And I think it gives one of the best pictures that I can think, that, that I have seen about what sacrifice is required, <clears throat> the kind of sacrifice is required for those who will be overcomers. And I'll just, I'll just paraphrase some of this, but before they crossed the Jordan River, this is what God said, God said to Joshua. So, beginning chapter 3, verse 2. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there will be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. He was telling this to all the children of Israel. He was saying, don't, you haven't been this way before, you stay back, because there are those who are going to show you the pathway. They're going to show you the way. And these are the priests that are bearing the ark. And they will go before you. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. And they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So shall you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And the Jordan was at flood stage at this time. And these priests are bearing this heavy Ark on their shoulders. And their job was to go down and to step into that rushing river. And they knew, they knew the importance of taking care of that ark. And they knew what would happen if somebody stumbled and fell. What, what would be their, uh, their demise would, it would be if they stumbled. And, but they did what God had asked them to do. And as soon as their feet touched the water, 
Then it, the, the flow stopped and it backed up 15 miles upstream or seven miles, which was it? Seven, or seven. Seven, seven miles yeah. upstream and stopped. And those priests stood in that river bed while something like four million people crossed the Jordan River on dry land. They stood there. How long do you think they would have to stand there with that ark? But they had to stand in that riverbed, which represents the place of sacrifice and suffering. As a type of Christ, they stood in that riverbed until everybody else went across. And that's, that's the kind of thing that God is calling his overcomers to do. And I want to say this to you tonight. <clears throat> I am confident in this statement, and I've checked it out with the other brethren that those who will be overcomers will be part of this pattern and structure that God has revealed to us in these last days. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. The overcoming company will conform to the pattern and fit themselves into the pattern or let the Spirit of God fit themselves into this pattern that God has revealed in these last days. This pattern, this structure, the foundation of Christ and the fivefold ministry, the, the pattern of, 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 of elders and deacons over local assemblies, the pattern of husbands and wives, fathers and mothers over the local ch over the church in the home, the basic building block, that pattern, the overcomers will come from that pattern. Amen. But if I may say this, the inverse is not necessarily true. Just because a person just associates themselves with what we call the move of the Spirit isn't the criteria. Right. The criteria is faithfulness to the pattern which God has established. Amen. We can say, oh, we belong to the move of the Spirit. You know, what church you go? Oh, I go to Global Missions, or I go to the move of the Spirit. That's okay for tax purposes <laughs> or keeping rolls. But that doesn't, God has no record up there of Global Missions. That's not in his book whatsoever. And the only, only thing in his book is Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. Amen. And I'm sure there are many, many names in that. But he also has another list that he's making, and that is these are the overcomers yeah. in the church. These are the ones who have been willing to conform to the pattern that I have set. And I was just thinking about, you know, when we, we speak about the cross and we speak about what has been accomplished for us through the cross. And we think about accepting the sacrifice of Jesus and what he has done for us. And that is good. That is a good thing. But that, that just, that benefits us. But if we could see the cross in a broader and deeper way, then God gets something also. You know, when, when Jesus died on the cross, that cross cut everything away that had to do with the flesh. And even, even before he went to the cross, even his baptism in the Jordan River by John was a type of that. It was a type of that death, burial, and resurrection. And everything that Jesus did from there on, had there was nothing of the flesh in him whatsoever. He only did what the Father said. And, and, and we go through that same thing too. And if we, can, if we can see that cross of Christ in us, cutting away not just forgiveness of sins, but cutting away, uh, being a sword that cuts us free from all of those things of our fleshly nature, and going in and, 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 and being buried, and as Jesus was resurrected, then then we are resurrected too. And when he ascends into heaven, that ascendancy for us means that Jesus has left us here on this earth to hold the ground that he has won for us. 
You know, the scripture in Ephesians, it talks about the body, or the armor of God. It, it's, it doesn't, it says there's a sword of the spirit, but it doesn't tell us to take any ground. It just says stand. <laughs> just having done all to stand. Our responsibility is to stand in that place, let that cross of Christ cut away all of those things day by day, moment by moment that are in us that have nothing to do with him so that we get to that place that Mark has talked about tonight and when the, with, there is nothing left of us and everything is him. When we're at that place, then we will be prepared to do those things which God has, has set aside for those who are willing to overcome. Yeah, I, you know, as I stand here today, I... I, I, I believe that I'm called and I believe that I'm chosen. But the faithfulness, that's where the test is. I hope I can pass it. <laughs> but it remains to be seen. You know, and that's the requirement. It's not a matter of being a part of global missions. It's not a, power, a matter of saying, you know, I'm part of the move of the Spirit. We can be part of the church, but do, do we hear that call? To be, to be among the overcomers. That's the tough part. But that is the part. Those are the ones that God. Those are the ones that God is looking for. As these last days approach. To take responsibility. For administration of the kingdom. And I think you know. When you look at things that people are going through. And you look at some of the tough things. I think you know. I don't think we have any idea. Of the what the responsibility is. Of administ administering the kingdom of God will be. I don't think we have a clue yet. We're getting, perhaps, we're getting a taste of it. We're getting a foretaste of those things. Hebrews talks about the church of today having a foretaste of these things that are coming in the kingdom. And I think we're going to get a more and more of a foretaste as, as time goes on. And then there will be that one day when Christ returns and we will, the last trumpet sounds in the twinkling of an eye. We shall not all sleep and we shall all be changed. Yeah. Let's stand. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your calling unto your people. Yes. Lord, we know that that call has gone out to every corner of the world and those that have ears to hear let them hear what the spirit is saying to the church in this hour lord give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts yeah. to understand yeah. that which you have called us to lord we believe in your choosing father now we are we are in that place where you are requiring us to, be, to have our metal tested yeah. to see if we will be faithful. And it's not just, it's just not for your entertainment or your enjoyment to see us in this, these situations, but because you know what will be required of those, we've already seen it in our elder brother who went to the cross and who died for us and who sacrificed everything, who gave up the glory that he had before he came. He gave it all up for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. And Father, we just pray tonight that somehow you, you don't expect us to do it overnight or in an instant, but day by day, Father, may we remember what you have called us to and help us, O oh God, not to sell our birthright for a pot of beans. Oh, Lord, we just ask your blessings to be upon your people tonight. Oh, Father, may we be inspired as never before that we are going to walk this way. We are going to stay on this path. Yes. We are going to do whatever is necessary. And we're going to give you permission, Lord, to do whatever is necessary in us to bring us to that place. God, help us, Father. <clears throat> To have the faith to believe in the trials that perhaps are, are still in store for us. Lord, we just ask your blessings now upon your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Are there announcements? Okay. Praise the Lord.
Right, regarding the meetings, as you know, the meetings are being taped, and tonight's meeting and all of them are good meetings to listen to again uh, to really get the full effect of them. If you want to watch these meetings, there's a couple ways that you can do it. If you're on Global Facebook, Global Missions Facebook, they're already on there, so you can go there at any time. If you're not in Global Missions Facebook, you can be. Uh, you need to have a regular Facebook account. If you have a Facebook account and you want to be on Global Missions Facebook, while you're here, just give me your email address and we'll, we'll add your name. That's one way to do it. The other way is all of these meetings are being uploaded and they're being placed on Global Missions YouTube. We're getting really high tech here. So it's on Global Missions YouTube. If you want to be able to watch it there, uh, on today's newsletter, there is a link and instructions on how to, how to join it. So you can join the Global Mission State of uh, YouTube and watch any of the meetings at any time, not just these, but other meetings as well. If you're not on the newsletter, you can sign up for the electronic newsletter. And the way that you do that, just write Jeff Olson, or you can give me your email while you're here. If you have any questions, email Jeff Olson and that's J Olson, J O L S O N, at globalmissionsinc.org. J Olson at globalmissions, with an S on it, inc.org. And Jeff can take care of any questions that you have as far as getting on the newsletter, or if you're having troubles getting on YouTube, anything, Jeff can sign you up. If you're interested in the Sharon Star, being delivered to your email digitally, you can write Jeff Olson as well and he'll take care of that. Now, tomorrow night, Lord willing, Lord willing, the altar may be opened up for the needs of the church. And by, when I say the needs of the church, that means the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There may be some that need prayer for healing. There may be others that need prayer for, for miscellaneous things. But for the general needs of the church, Lord willing, unless things change, tomorrow night there'll be living water flowing all through the altar. And I just want you to know that ahead of time to kind of prepare your hearts. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, the door will be open. There will be an opportunity. If you want to be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues, there will be an opportunity for you tomorrow night, most likely, Lord willing. If you need healing, you look to the Lord tonight and tomorrow for the Lord to touch you, to prepare your heart to receive from God tomorrow night. It takes yes. a, a little preparation. So let's be very prepared for tomorrow night for the Holy Spirit to move in a, in a very wonderful way. Brother Reggie would like to give when there's an update yeah. on your, your mom's situation. Uh, this morning when we got a call, and Brother Andy can just testify when my dad called. He was truly upset because of where mom went overnight. Uh, but the wonderful thing is God is good. Because I thought I was going to have to just sit there going, it just kind of remind me of North Battleford in 90 or 2000 when I went there for feast. And I get there and uh, get a phone call. Brian Hannigan pulls me up. Reggie, your dad's in the hospital. And I flown all the way up to Canada. Was there for the first time. I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go home right away and miss camp. camp. Well, my mom wanted me to be here, and it sounds like I'm going to get a stay because uh, mom had a good day. And uh, and what's another really cool thing is the hospice nurse. One of the hospice nurse that was charged for my mom's case so happens to be a good friend of mine uh -huh. and I just want to read her text that she sent me right before I right before the meeting and uh, she just said uh, hi sweetie friend I saw your mama today I know you're busy with church camp but wanted to give you an update she was good today a little gunked up uh, in her lungs her left lobe was cleared uh, a little bit gucky but cleared with a cough we thought she was going to have pneumonia and everything 
and she had a really good cough and her lung cleared up from, from what it was. Amen. So this is God good. Amen. This is God good. Amen. So I just thank you for your prayers. I just wanted to give you that uh, quick little update. She said the, her pulse was good, she was strong, and she sat up well. Amen. All those things are just wonderful things, wonderful testimonies. So God is good. Yeah. So just wanted to let you know. Yep. So. Uh,